Hello, my name is Abigail Richardson Schulte, and I'm composer in residence with the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra, and I am joined by our very fine concertmaster, Stephen Satarsky. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Abby. How are you? Good, thanks. Excellent. Good. You're doing a, a lot of uh, duties here with us this season. You've been playing uh, soloist, and you've been conducting. But really, when I what I want to find out is about you being concertmaster, because we see you doing some things on stage, and I'm sure you do a lot of things off stage too. And so it'd be great to find out a little bit more about that. So first of all, I know you've been concertmaster at other orchestras. Can you tell us some? Uh, I was the second chair or the associate concertmaster uh, of both the Canadian Opera Company Orchestra way back in the late 80s. And then uh, for the early 90s, I was the second chair of the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, where I probably led the, the orchestra for maybe a quarter of the season on average. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there was an opening uh, for a real first chair concertmaster job in Kitchener-Waterloo and I won that job and I was there for 15 years and then I decided uh, that 15 years was time to explore other things and so one of the other things became the Hamilton Philharmonic and I've been here for I don't know the exact amount of years now but it's probably close to 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you you came in maybe a, maybe a really close to me and I'm coming up on 10. Yeah, yeah so somewhere around then. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Uh, so what does a concertmaster do behind the scenes, off stage? <laughs> I know there are many things here, but maybe you can right. pick a few. Um, so the, probably the most obvious thing uh, is one of the responsibilities of the concertmaster is, you know, when you watch the string section and the bows are all moving in a certain direction. I mean, you generally only have two choices up and down, but if you can imagine a, a string section of, of 20, 30, 40 players and the bows are all moving in different directions at different times, you can imagine it's going to look a little bit chaotic and maybe not even sound that great because uh, people are not articulating the same way and, you know, so it, for the sound and for the, the visual, it's important that uh, the musicians' bows are moving more or less. Uh, the same way at the same time. So I get to go sort of study the music ahead of time. And if I know the conductor, I kind of know how closely they'll follow the composer's intentions or whether they're, they're likely to stretch things out a little bit. I have to know how many players there are because if there are really long, long melodies um, and we have a very small string section, we probably have to add a few more bowings uh, to just for uh, the volume of sound in order to be heard properly. So there are a lot of sort of these variables that have to be taken into account for each piece in every single program. And even if we played a piece before and we come back to it, some of those variables might have changed and I might have to take those into account for the next time that, that we perform that. So that's kind of the, the main administrative duty that I have um, that audiences will know um, whether things are working properly or not. Um, beyond that, um, I'm involved in the audition process. So every time there's an opening for uh, a new player to join the orchestra, we have auditions for those, um, for those open positions. And I've been on every single audition committee that I was physically able to, to be on since I joined the orchestra. Um, so that's really important, obviously, because when we're you know, picking a permanent member, we need to find the absolute best person available if, if possible. Of course. Uh, so there's, there's that. I'm also on the Artistic Advisory Committee, um, which is a group of different stakeholders within the Hamilton Phil um, umbrella uh, that get together basically and talk about, so what are we going to play? How are we going to present it? Um, who, what is our audience uh, that we're, we're targeting for any specific things? Do we need to go outside of the hall for particular music or particular programs? Do we need a smaller ensemble for, for this or that or the other? So there's all these sort of broad issues and sometimes specific issues like we need to do a Beethoven symphony this season. Which one should we do? And then everyone's like, well, I really like this one. Oh, I really like that one. Uh, so sometimes there are, you know, um, there are, are reasons to choose a particular piece. And sometimes it's just, you know, how passionate are we to perform certain music? So that's another um, role. And I guess um, whenever there's an opportunity, uh, occasionally at receptions and other um, kind of meetings with um, either the audience or um, again, various stakeholders in, in, in the city or, or in the organization, I represent the musicians in the orchestra, sort of a figurehead more than anything, but uh, 
if you can't in, invite an entire orchestra to an event, um, you will likely invite at least the concertmaster to represent um, the musicians. And when I shake hands or bump elbows or fists or whatever with the conductor right before a concert and after pieces, it's not because I did a particularly great job and he's congratulating me. I'm shaking hands on behalf of the entire group of musicians. I was going to ask you about that because that also extends to soloists and to composers as well. So they're essentially thanking the orchestra then by correct. thanking you. Is that yeah, correct? Exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's interesting how much work you do behind the scenes. Uh, right. I know that's a lot. Now let's get to the things on stage. So you have your own entrance, and that really yeah. signifies the beginning of the concert, right? right? You, you yeah. walk on, and, and then you tune the orchestra, but it seems like the oboe is giving the tuning. So why, right. why are you doing What's that yeah, all about? Yeah, you know, th this, is, this is one of those rituals that um, I, the walk-on anyway, is, is one of those rituals that I, I feel kind of uncomfortable about because it's, it's a little bit of a throwback to the, you know, the history of the concertmaster, and the concertmaster really did used to be the master of the concert. There was no conductor at the beginning, right. and so the lead violinist, who could put him or herself in a, in a position where everyone could see them, and when they move, and the thing about playing violin is that there's a lot of the same kind of movements that you would get from a conductor but we're playing our instruments at the same time. So it started off with the concertmaster really being the leader of the whole concert event, um, and therefore a solo sort of walk-on would be appropriate for that. Uh, now, I don't know why we've kept that tradition. I think probably because it's just, it signals to the audience, okay, things are really about to start. You know, people are sort of milling about, they're talking to their neighbors, there's a little bit of you know, chit chat going on, the lights go down, you see the concertmaster come out, okay, now we're just about ready to get started and everyone settles in. Um, so maybe it is good to kind of to keep that, that ritual going. Mm -hmm. um, but to get a solo bow, especially in this orchestra, this orchestra, we have so many stars, we have so many amazing players, as you'll hear in this program tonight, um, that I, I really kind of feel um, quite bashful walking out there and taking a, a bow when I know that so many of my colleagues uh, you know, deserve that same kind of attention each and every night. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too that uh, in Europe, I don't think they have the walk-on for the concertmaster. Europe has tried a bunch of different things, including having the entire orchestra walk on stage together and then sit down and, and, and then tune. Um, it's really hard to organize stuff like that. Right. That's part of the reason we don't do it here. Another part of the reason is that um, in order for musicians to feel really comfortable right before the concert, they kind of need to be in their chair. They have to get all their stuff set up and just in the right, you know, place and to check the reeds and to mm -hmm. check the, the bow and, you know, make sure everything's working properly. Because we all just sort of walk on together, sit down, the conductor comes out, gives a downbeat and something isn't quite right. Yeah. It could be a little panicky yeah. um, for, that, for that player. So I, I kind of understand why we yeah. do things the way we do. But, you know, it's weird because you think of other art forms like ballet or opera and, and you know, the, the audience doesn't sort of sit in their chairs five minutes before the concert and see the ballerinas sort of practicing their twirls <laughs> oh, and, yeah, and doing yeah. all their moves and whatever. So yeah. it's, it's Although a, it's a glorious sound, an orchestra warming up. I it, love it. It's kind of, well, yeah. it can be. It, it can be. It can be. Good point. Yeah. And now uh, the tuning. Why is the oboe giving the A, yet you stand up and appear to be giving the tuning? Right. Uh, so if, if there's a piece of music that we're starting with or, or in the middle of a concert that is only strings, such as the, the piece that I'm playing in uh, tonight, um, then of course the concertmaster will just give the A from his own instrument. Um, the oboe has a very stable reedy, well of course it's reeds, right, but a very reedy sound. It's a very um, distinct tone that the oboe pr produces. For example, when you compare it with the flute or the clarinet, those are a lot rounder and sort of fluffier sounding um, tones, right? And it's a little harder to match exactly where that pitch is, whereas the oboe, just, it's, it's just that instrument that everyone can kind of really zero in on, I guess. Uh, and of course, the oboe player has, I don't know if the audience knows this, but the oboe player usually has a little box on the stand. It's called a tuning machine or whatever they call it. Um, and they play and they make sure that the, the note that they're giving is, is close to 
the exact pitch that Perfect. that we need, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas one, if I walk out there and I give an A, I'm like pretty sure this is good. You know, hopefully it's good. But but the oboe really has it nailed down. Mm -hmm. so. I see. Yeah. Um, now, uh, let's talk about some other things about you being on stage. How are you able to be a leader of the orchestra while sitting on stage playing at the same time? Can you sort of pull people in and, and shape them around you? Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, if, if you imagine that the conductor is the visionary of a piece, it's th they have their own interpretation of that music and they've shaped it carefully and they have a certain concept that they want to do. And a lot of that will be painting the musical picture in the air with their physicality. So the way they give a gesture and the way they move their hands and the way they look at people, the way they gesture um, to whichever section um, needs attention at that moment. I don't like it when conductors are bona fide traffic cops. Basically, it's like, okay, you stop, now you come, and you stop, you know, like, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat helpful, but it, it's really not artistic, yeah. you know, if you just sort of cue the players that are supposed to play, well, professional players can count. Yeah, it might be they necessary know when they're in a coming youth orchestra, in. but right. not a professional, yeah. Right, so if you imagine that a, at, at this level of professional orchestras, when we have a conductor, we really want them to show us the sounds that they would like us to make. And I know that sounds very abstract, but when, when you've done this a long time, you really understand what a gesture means and the way it's done and the kind of sound that you're expected to make. Now, that said, if the conductor is, is busy looking after the bassoons and the horns and really shaping something that they're playing and the strings have you know, some sort of banal kind of accompaniment that goes along with it, well, the conductor shouldn't have to worry about us playing that together. So in that point, I'll just subtly kind of take up a, a subordinate conducting role and just mm. move in a way so that it's just nice and easy and easy to follow and um, will allow the conductor to then pay attention to the things that they feel are more interesting than the yup, bup, 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 bup. You know, if that's all the audience sees is that and then there's a beautiful melody going on over there, it's just gonna kind of look weird. Right, so, so you can really make a tight string section then. That's Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, so look, the two words that I use for anyone in a leadership position, certainly in music, and probably applies to many other things, is just be helpful. Be helpful. So the conductor's job is to let us, give us as, as clear instructions as possible as to how to most comfortably play the music the way the conductor feels it. And my job is just to fill in wherever there might be some gaps in the attention that the conductor can give, because you can't, no conductor can really, you know, be looking after 100% of the orchestra 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, so I do feel that that's um, an area that is, I can be helpful. Yeah, got it. And I've, um, I can't tell you how many times, uh, just out of the blue after a concert, someone, you know, in the trumpet section or trombone or, or percussion or whatever is like, hey, I really appreciated, you know, you showing the beats there because... Oh, they can see you that far yeah, away. Yeah, wow, yeah. interesting. And that's partly why the, the lead violin has retained a lot of that sort of artistic power over the years is because you are visual and you're right next to the conductor and can really feel the vibes you know, right. that are coming from them and able to, because when you're, when you're in the trumpet section, and I've rarely sat that far away from the podium, but a few times, it's really difficult. I don't think audiences understand enough how difficult it is to be f really far away mm -hmm. and to have all the sound going in the opposite direction to where you're sitting. So basically, if you're sitting there and you're listening to what's happening in front of you and reacting to it, you're always gonna be late. So these poor guys at the back of the orchestra have to anticipate like crazy, be right on top of the beat because their sound takes a fraction longer to speak into the hall than everyone else. I never thought of that. It's yeah. really treacherous being back there. And uh, you know, anytime you hear an orchestra that plays really well together, you know there's a lot of ensemble discipline mm -hmm. uh, going on from the back. Now, does your role change if there is a guest conductor? We have quite a lot of guest conductors. Do you have a bit more responsibility in that case? It depends on the guest conductor, actually. Um, certainly when um, we're playing a program with Gemma, 
uh, well, we've worked with her now, this is what, five, six, six years anyway, I think? Yeah, Something least, like that. Um, so we have all got a sense of, of kind of where she's coming from as a musician, as an artist, as a, as a visionary. Mm -hmm. And Gemma tends to be, she tends not to want to change the composer's wishes very much. Like a few times when something just doesn't work, of course, you need to find a solution. But often Gemma, will, she really wants us to do the way the composer wants it played. And that makes it my job a lot easier because then I know when I'm preparing the Boeings and when I'm, I'm rehearsing the piece for, for myself, um, that she's not likely to stray very far from the same instructions that I have at home. Now, if we get a guest conductor I've never worked with before playing music that maybe I don't know very well, um, then it's, when I come to the first rehearsal, it's really like, trying to absorb as much as possible, as fast as possible, about the style of conducting, about the style of communicating, about, um, let's say, how much of a control freak they are sometimes. If I, if I sense that a conductor just wants to control everything going on at all times, then I, I'll probably just stay out of the way a little bit uh, and not try to, because I, don't, I, I won't be able to anticipate what they want, and then there's gonna be sort of a clash of my vision with their vision. So typically, if I see the conductor is really you know, on top of everything, then I'll just sit back, okay, it's your show. So <laughs> it's her. I'll just go along for the ride. Um, whereas other conductors will, like I said, they'll, they'll be, you know, if they're Tai Chi conductors where they're just painting in the air or, you know, drawing these, these lovely abstract shapes, uh, and the rest of the orchestra's like, uh, wh where's the beat? <laughs> and then, you know, I know that, I've, okay, I've gotta just be really steady and make, make a lot of eye contact with my colleagues to make sure that we're all kind of, you know, working together. And mm -hmm. So it really depends. It, and and it's, um, it, it can be really exciting at times when you get a guest conductor you haven't worked with before who's got a really interesting approach, you know, to a certain piece or to music making in, in general. Um, but it can also be kind of kind of scary because mm -hmm. it just don't you're not used to seeing what the way that they're conducting and the way that they they move their stick and and it just takes sometimes until the concert to really feel okay I think I know exactly <laughs> where, where I need to be right oh, yeah. it's interesting to learn uh, mm -hmm. some of the things you're you're up against there mm -hmm. now uh, this season as I mentioned we've seen you conduct and play as soloist so this might be a strange question, but is it easier or harder to do those types of things at your home orchestra? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I think it depends on the orchestra, and I think it obviously depends on one's you know, personal and professional relationship with, with the orchestra. Uh, if, and I won't get into any sordid details, but if for some reason you don't get along with certain key players in the orchestra, um, from either a personal or artistic point of view, or both, uh, and then you have to get up there and expose yourself and be vulnerable, you know, as a soloist or, or as a conductor, um, th then it can, it can be tough, actually. It can be really tough, because um, they, know, they know you too well, kind mm -hmm. of. They know your, your weaknesses, they know your, your vulnerabilities, uh, and then you, you, you can kind of feel a little exposed. Um, whereas when you're working with um, an orchestra where there's a great relationship, which we have here in Hamilton. When I get up in front of, the, in front of that orchestra, my orchestra, our orchestra, I, I just feel nothing but support and encouragement, and they really want me to do well. And it's just, I can't tell you what an amazing feeling that is, you know, uh, to do things that I don't conduct all the time and I don't play solos all the time, right? So these are things that. Every once in a while, I have to get up there and, and do it, and um, I'm kind of nervous. Like, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to do that. I really, I have a lot of sympathy for people who solo all the time, although if you do it all the time, They're of course, used to it. <laughs> you're more used to it. Yep. But, but still, it's, it's really tough. It's a tough job getting up 
in front of a a big group, you know. No question, doing yeah. really difficult things yeah. at that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my last question for you uh, is about being concert master, and I, you know, through the years I've heard stories of strange things happening, like you know, maybe a soloist uh, snaps a string or something, and the concert master hands over over their violin, leaves the stage, gets another one. Have you ever been in circumstances like that, or where something unusual has happened to you as concert master? Absolutely. Um, I can tell you a couple of stories. Fun. Uh, <laughs> First one involved uh, is when I was concert master of the Kitchen Waterloo Symphony and involved a fantastic young violinist at the time, young violinist Karen Gomio, mm -hmm. who was, uh, uh, she's Japanese Canadian and she came and played um, quite a famous concerto by Saint-Saëns, you know, the third concerto. And there's a bit right at the beginning of the last movement where there's a sort of a big gesture with an up bow. Um, and there's where the, the, the bow hair is tucked in to the bottom of the bow because it's basically just stretched hair held by a piece at the end and held by the piece at the bottom. And that little piece has a tiny, tiny little lip. And it just so happens she hit the bridge oh. with this tiny lip in this big gesture and knocked it out of place. It just, didn't just fall over. Just explain what the bridge is. So the bridge is the, the thing that holds the, the strings over, um, top of the fingerboard and the violin, so, so it allows the string to ring. Um, I, I wish I had my violin to, to <laughs> demonstrate it, but so the bridge is where all four strings cross and, and it holds them up and we place the bow just to the other side of where the bridge is placed, right? And then we change the pitch on the fingerboard. So she hit the bridge, knocked the bridge uh, like a few millimeters off, but she couldn't play anymore because of course the tuning of her instrument was completely out and she looked down and it's like I can't, I, I can't play right Stradivarius and she's wearing this beautiful ball gown there's no table there's no chair there's nothing for her like, she can't put her instrument like on the floor and like so so she looks to me and sort of hands it to me and I'm like I look around and and everyone was like you know <laughs> So I handed my violin to my, my uh, stand partner and I took her Stradivarius and I sort of, you have to tune the strings down a little bit to reduce some of the pressure so I could move the bridge. And I moved the bridge back by eye, just I think that looks about right. So you did violin repair on stage <laughs> in the concert? Handed it back to her. She kind of, you know, refines the tuning a little bit. We start the movement over and, you know, to her credit, uh, nerves of steel, it was flawless. I, could, I can't imagine after something like that. Wow. But, uh, so that's one interesting story. And I'll tell you one other quick story. When I was playing uh, with the Symphony Nova Scotia way, way back in the, in the 1980s, uh, Anton Querti was the soloist uh, for Brahms' first piano concerto. And uh, it was being recorded live uh, for a radio broadcast. And we play the first movement. And he, I mean, he, you know, he played fantastic and, and everything was wonderful. But he stands up and he, and he turns to the audience. We're all like, uh oh, what's going to happen? You know, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, don't, I don't know how you've been able to, to put up with this. And, and I know I can't deal with this any longer. This piano is so dreadfully out of tune that if you don't mind, give me 10 minutes and I just need to make some. So literally they're in the middle of a concert, live through air radio. And Anton Querity goes backstage, gets his toolbox, brings it out and tunes the piano in live in the middle of a concert. Oh my gosh. So those are a couple of things that have happened <laughs> over the years that were kind of interesting yeah. to be on stage for. No question, no yeah. question. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for talking with me today, Stephen. I am sure that we will give uh, our audiences a, a new appreciation yeah. for what it is to be concertmaster, and it's, it's right. great to have you with our organization. Thanks, thanks Abby, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.